Hi everyone, my name is Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringal Anglican Church and I'd like to welcome you uh, to our service today. Uh, if it's your first time here, it's great to have you. If you've been here many times before, welcome back. It's lovely to have you here. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? I looked out the window today, it's just a glorious day. Uh, the clear blue sky, gentle breeze, the sun is shining. And what a beautiful place Jeringal is. If you've never been here, you must come and visit. There's, uh, the, there's beautiful beaches, there's rolling hills. As I woke up this morning, there was a blanket of mist in the valley. It was so, it's indeed glorious. Of course, the, the most impressive part of Jerringong is right in the centre of town. There's a beautiful white stone church, uh, Jerringong Anglican Church. Uh, it's a beautiful church, but uh, it's full of beautiful people. People who are kind and generous and welcoming. Uh, it's a great place to be. What am I doing? You may be wondering what I'm doing. Well, it's quite simple, really. What I'm doing is praising. Praising is a great religious word, but it's talking about something that's perfectly normal. We praise things all the time when we say how great they are. You can probably think of great things about where you are and about the day when you're watching this or about the people that you know. We see people praising uh, when we go to the football, where we used to be allowed to, uh, to, they're cheering their team and singing how great they are. We see people praising when they sing love songs on the radio or, or on Spotify. We see people praising uh, the firefighters uh, who did such an amazing job in, in this, this area uh, just in this previous summer. We see people praising uh, the medical profession who do an incredible job during coronavirus. It's a perfectly natural thing for us to do, to praise. It's actually one of the things that we do when we get together as church. We praise God. We praise God. It's not something um, magical or mystical. What it is, it's just saying how amazing God is. And one of the great things about praising is that as you praise, it actually can, helps you to enjoy the thing all the more. And so as you see a beautiful sunset, and as you share that sunset with someone else, say, look at those colours. Look at the, the oranges and the yellows and even kind of greens in there. As you share your praise with others, it helps you in the enjoying of it. And so as we gather together as church, we praise God together. It's one of the things that Christians have been doing throughout the ages when they get together. We're actually going to be starting our service in a moment uh, by doing just that. We're going to be singing a great song of praise to God. It's, a, it's an old hymn that's been given a bit of a modern flavour. It's a song that uh, you, may, you may well know. It's called All Creatures of Our God and King. So how about we start our service by praising our God and King together.
having sung to God, we're now going to hear from God. In a little while, uh, John is going to be continuing our series looking at the wonderful Jesus. The focus today is on forgiveness. We all know about God's forgiveness to us, but also there's an implication for the way we forgive each other. Before John comes to speak, we're going to be hearing from God's word. Two members of our congregation, Anne and Josh, are going to be uh, reading from us, to us from Matthew 18. But before that, it's going to be time for our family spot. But before we even get to that, let us remind ourselves of the things that bind us together. I'm going to invite you to join with me as we say a creed, which is just a statement of the things that we believe. This creed is based on six passages from the New Testament that describe to us the wonders of what God has done for us. You'll see the words coming up at the bottom of the screen. So will you join with me as we say these words together? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of all things. We believe that amongst all people, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. All have turned away from God. We believe that because of this, all people face death and judgment. We believe that God sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who died for our sins once for all. And we believe that in his great mercy, God has given us new spiritual birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We have chosen to trust in and follow Jesus Christ. Through him we are saved from the punishment we deserve and we have the assurance of eternal life. Amen. Over to you, Kat. Hey, Jerem Gong. Welcome back for another family spot. How are you guys all going with the new change of weather with the winter? I'm not really great, to be honest. That's why I'm sitting in front of this heater. It's kind of the way that our family rolls. We kind of hug them. We don't really hug them. That's, that's dangerous, kids. It's dangerous. But we sit in front of them and we rug up. If you're really that cold and you don't have enough winter goods, you should check out the church's op shop, the Jerangong Thrift. See what I did there, Ronwen? Shameless plug, right? We've got plenty of scarves and plenty of jackets that are coming in. And now today, we're going to be jumping into another parable. Before we jump into the parable, kids, I have one question for you. Have you ever had to come to someone and ask forgiveness? It's kind of like when we have to say sorry to someone. Only for them to turn around and say, well, I don't accept that story. Today's Bible story is being captured by an artist in a cartoon by Saddleback Kids. So sit back and be listening. Stories of the Bible. The Parable of the Unforgiving Servant This is Jesus hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like walking on water oh, hey guys. and even raised people from the dead. One day, Jesus was talking with his disciples and teaching them when Peter asked, Um, Peter? How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus said, No, not seven times, but seventy times seven. Then Jesus told a parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to get his money back that he had let his servants borrow. While the king was doing this, one of the servants who owed him a million dollars was brought in. One million dollars, please? The servant couldn't pay, so the king ordered that he be sold, along with his family and everything he owned, to pay the debt. Wait, please! But the servant begged the king, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his king was filled with pity for him and he let him go and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, 
he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Uh, hi? Come here, Will. He grabbed him and demanded that he pay him back immediately. Oh, wait, please. His fellow servant begged for a little more time. He said, be patient with me and I will pay it. No. But the servant wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be punished until he had paid all that he owed. Jesus then said, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Yikes. <laughs> that servant. Whoa. Now, I wonder what you guys think that what the king did was fair. And I wonder if there's anything in this story that you would think is unforgivable. You just couldn't forgive at all. In Matthew 18, verse 35, it says, When we forgive, we need to forgive from the heart. Kids, ask an adult that you're sitting with to share a story about a time where they have had to forgive from the heart. And if you're not with kids, maybe write it down or share it with someone that's with you. Or if you're on your own, email it to me. I'd love to hear your stories of how you've forgiven people from the heart. That's it from me today. If you'd like to discuss more of the questions that will come up on the screen, then go for it and pray together as a family or pray with God solo. See ya. This reading comes from Matthew 18, 15 to 20. The brother who sins against you. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose, lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Here ends the reading. Um, we're going to continue on in Matthew, uh, starting at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. 
Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here ends the reading. Well, hello there, my name is John and I'm one of the ministers here at Jerangong Anglican Church. Now, during the recent lockdown, lots of people spent lots of time doing puzzles, jigsaw puzzles. Now, I don't know if you like puzzles and I don't know how you handle it when difficult issues come up in your life. But I've got a puzzle for you, a conundrum, not a jigsaw, for us all to solve. As a Christian, what are you going to do when another Christian sins against you? Because it's just not supposed to be like that, is it? We're supposed to love each other and look out for each other, treat each other as brother and sister. But we all know that it doesn't work out this way all the time. We all stumble. We all fail to treat others as we should. Hence our big question, our puzzle for today. What do we do when it happens to us? Well, from this week's passage, we can see that there are two things we need to be doing. We need to seek their repentance and we need to forgive them. And so those are the two things we're going to be talking about uh, today. Now these are big things, these are hard things, and it's probably best that we start by praying. Please join with me. Heavenly Father, please help us to be open and honest about ourselves and our relationships with others. Please speak to us by your word. Um, change us by your spirit. Amen. Now, in answer to this question, the first thing that we should do when someone sins against us can be seen in verses 15 to 20 of Matthew chapter 18. We are to seek the repentance of of the one who has sinned against us. And what does the passage say about how we do this? Well, from verses 15 to 17, it looks quite straightforward, really. We go and show that person his or her fault in order to win them over. And if they don't listen, we talk it over with him or her, with one or two other people there as well. And then if that doesn't work, we talk it over again with the whole church. And if they still don't repent, we are to treat him or her as if they weren't part of the body of believers. Okay, so that's the answer. There's what we should do. But the full answer comes from reading between the lines, looking at why we should do this. And this is really quite surprising. You see, our response to someone else sinning against us isn't all about getting justice or vengeance or even compensation. It's actually about putting the other person first. You probably haven't thought about it like that before. You see, when someone sins against you, the thing you should be worried about is that a dear brother or sister has sinned and that they need to deal with that. The crucial first step to take is that you go to them. See, often we settle for nursing a grudge or waiting for them to come to us to apologise. And the important thing when we have been sinned against uh, is not that we should get justice, but that the sinner should repent. You see, Jesus wants us to actively seek to resolve the situation, to stop someone else sinning. And uh, what we're going to do now is see how we, go, how we actually go about that. So first, it's in private. Then it's with a couple of others and then perhaps with the whole church. And the goal is that they should repent, and this will actually bring about reconciliation between you. Now, this process of reconciliation looks quite harsh if it doesn't work. Because if it doesn't work, the end result is exclusion from Christian fellowship. 
And that's a big deal, and it doesn't look too loving. But remember, this is the end result. We don't just jump straight to that. It comes after a long process of talking through things with them in private, and then with a couple of others, and then with the whole church. And that only occurs, the exclusion part, should only occur when someone absolutely refuses to acknowledge or repent of obvious sin in their life. Something perhaps which goes against them, you know, being a Christian, what it means to be a Christian. Something which could have big consequences for them in the long term. See, refusing to repent when sin has been pointed out to you isn't just stubbornness. It's unrepentant rebellion against God. You see, what we've got here is tough love. We're actually trying to show that person the seriousness of what is actually going on for them. Because we want them to turn back. We want them to deal with it and enjoy full relationship with their brothers and sisters. It's not about punishment. It's not about us getting revenge for what they've done by kicking them out. It's about us loving them and wanting what will be best for them. Now we could, and probably at some stage should, spend a lot more time exploring this issue of excluding someone from fellowship because of unrepentant sin. It raises a lot of questions, particularly when we're trying to work out what verses 18 to 20 have to do with it. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure I've got my head all the way around these verses myself. But I think they highlight what a big deal excluding someone from Christian fellowship actually is and why it's such a good thing to try to resolve everything before it gets to that point. But we've you know, only got limited time, uh, even on video online church. So I want to move on to the second aspect of dealing with someone sinning against you. Because I, this, I think that this part of the conundrum, this part of the puzzle, is something we all need to get our teeth into. And that is forgiving someone who has sinned against you. Now the other day I rediscovered a favourite photo of Amelie when she was a toddler. And when she was that age, I was, you know, started remembering all the things you know, that used to happen back then. Uh, it's been a while now. Uh, but when she was that age, she loved a particular TV show called Bambaloo, which you know, no one's ever heard of ever since then. Uh, you probably don't know of it. Anyway, you know, it was a kid's show. There was a girl living in a treehouse with a dog, a fish, and a parrot, and a couple of mice. You know, busy treehouse. Uh, the animals were all, of course, puppets. And they had all sorts of adventures. And the way each episode would work is that there was some little dilemma, and it was always solved by someone telling a story to resolve the puzzle, the conundrum. Now, in verses 21 to 35 of Matthew 18, we see Jesus employing the same technique, not living in a treehouse with puppets, but telling a story to solve a puzzle. You see, as a result of what he's just been teaching about seeking out the brother or sister who sinned against you, one of the disciples comes to him with a question. And so Jesus answers with a story, a parable. And so we read that Peter asks, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And this is a very practical, you know, rubber hits the road question. Where should we draw the line? Because we want to be forgiving, but we don't want to be doormats, do we? And Peter's answer to his own question is actually showing a pretty generous approach. After all, would you have kept forgiving someone after they've done the same thing to you three times or four or five? Probably not. Yet Peter is suggesting seven times. It, it sounds like he's understood what Jesus has said about forgiveness, doesn't it? Except he hasn't. You see, Jesus says not seven times, but 77 times. Now, I don't think Jesus means exactly 77 times. He means don't count, just keep on forgiving. And since there's a lot more to be said about this issue, here's where the story starts. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. A man who owes him 10,000 talents is brought to him. And since he's not able to pay, the master orders that he and his wife and his children and everything that he has be sold to pay the debt. Now that sounds like this king is a really, really, really harsh man at this point, doesn't it? And that's because the institution of slavery is so foreign to us and is so abhorrent to us nowadays. 
But we need to see this parable in its context. And leaving aside whether the, the whole kind of concept of slavery itself is right, what we're talking about here is something a bit more specific. It's called debt slavery. It's being sold into slavery to pay off debts. And this was actually quite a common practice in those days. It was one of the, the established ways of securing loans. It was a bit like having a mortgage, except it's over yourself and not your house. And if you leave aside what you may or may not think about the banks and their lending policies and all that sort of thing, if we hear of someone who has to sell their house because they can't make their mortgage repayments, we of course think it's very sad and unfortunate, but we also know that that's the way these things work. Um, in fact, we do have something in our society a little bit like this. Did you know you can serve time in jail instead of paying your traffic fines? Not that any of you are getting traffic fines, of course. Well, you know, that's what's happening here. The king is just doing the lawful thing he needs to do in order to get his money back. He's perfectly within his rights. And the reason it's not just the man, but it's his whole family and everything he owns is because we're actually talking about an astronomical sum of money that is owned here, owed here. You see, 10,000 talents isn't like $10,000, a big sum of money, but you know, a kind of achievable, practical sum of money to, to borrow and repay. The exchange rate section in the newspaper or online probably doesn't tell you what a talent equates to nowadays, but we can do a bit of estimation. A talent was about 25 kilograms of gold or silver, probably silver in this case. So one talent is an absolute fortune, 25 kilos of gold or silver. That's a lot of money. And now we've got here 10,000 talents. This is a debt equivalent to 250,000 kilograms of very precious metal. It's an astronomical sum. It's the sort of money that nowadays only those, you know, Middle Eastern oil princes with vast fortunes, you know, can spend. Or, you know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, that guy that owned Ikea, you know, whatever it is. The, the richest people in the world can throw these sorts of sums around. Uh, it's probably more than what our government is currently spending to try and rescue our economy and keep it alive during this whole uh, COVID-19 crisis. So of course, the king wants his money back. I don't know why he's lent that much money to start with, but the king wants his money back. And this servant was never, ever, ever going to be able to repay this debt, even when he and his entire family and everything he had had been sold off. And this is what makes this next part of the parable just so astounding. The servant begs the king, please be patient with me, I'll pay back everything, and the king has mercy on him and cancels the debt and lets him go. He cancelled the debt. That vast, almost incalculable debt was just cancelled because the king had pity, because the king showed mercy. There wasn't even a need for you know Bono to lobby the UN or Bob Geldof to organise a massive series of international rock concerts or anyone coming up with a hashtag, forgive your servant's debt. This king just did it. And then the servant goes out, finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, grabs him, chokes him, and demands that he pays it back. And it helps to know, you know what we're talking about in terms of the sums of money here. One denarius is a day's wage for a labourer. So this debt of a hundred denarii is over three months' wages. It's not a small debt. But it's a realistic debt. It's able to be paid off, able to be worked off over three months. But more to the point, when you contrast this debt with what the first servant had just been forgiven by the king, it's tiny, it's a pittance. And so this servant falls on his knees and begs, have mercy, you know, be patient, I'll pay you back. And the first servant doesn't. And he has him thrown into prison. And so we read that the other servants are very upset about this obvious hypocrisy. They complain to the king and he's furious. And he has the first servant thrown into jail to be tortured until he can pay back the debt. Now that's a great story, but in case you've missed the point, Jesus makes it very clear what he means by this story. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. So what we learn from this parable is quite straightforward. We are to forgive our brothers and sisters, not just several times, but continually from the heart. And the reason for this is also quite straightforward. We should forgive because we have been forgiven. You see, the principle behind this is the central truth of the Christian message, the Christian gospel. God is the creator and ruler of the world. He is our heavenly father, the almighty king. It's his world, we're his creation. Yet we've all spent all of our lives living our own way as if God didn't exist, ignoring him, ignoring his will for our lives. And just like the king in today's parable, the time will come when God will settle his accounts, when we will stand before him with no way of paying back, paying off the accumulated debt of a lifetime of rebelling against him. But God had pity on us, just like the king in the parable, even though we didn't deserve it. God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, the same man who taught this parable. He was sent by God to take the punishment for us, to die on a cross in our place and come back to life again. And you see, we're just like that first servant. If we acknowledge our debt, our rebellion to, you know, against God, and if we beg for his forgiveness in the name of his son Jesus, then he will forgive us. Our slate will be wiped clean and we are reconciled to God. In our According to Matthew series, this is what we talked about a few weeks ago, the wonder of reconciliation. And so the end result is because we have been given so much and been forgiven so much, I should say, we are to forgive our brothers and sisters. Seems quite straightforward. I'm sure I'm not saying anything new here. Many of you know this already. You know what it means to be a Christian. You probably could spot the point of this parable a mile away. Might be that this is exactly what you expected me to say. Nothing new, nothing that particularly changes your understanding is going on here. This uh, sermon, it's just, you know, familiar sounds of the radio or your playlist playing in the background of your life. Not to listen to, but, you know... Good thing to you know watch church on a Sunday or whatever day of the week you're watching this. Listen to the sermon. But actually, this isn't straightforward. It's straightforward to understand, but it's not straightforward to live out. You see, this is really important, this principle, but it's hard. It's incredibly challenging. It's not about maintaining a vague sense of general tolerance towards everyone around you or forgiving people that you've had some mild disagreement with. Nor is it being about being polite to the people you haven't really forgiven and keeping up the appearances of fellowship. It's not about sweeping things under the carpet and avoiding overlooking the conflict. See, this isn't about knowing that you should forgive people and looking like you do forgive people. It's about actually forgiving people in your heart, cancelling the debt. And so this is about taking that really hard first step to actually forgive someone against whom you may secretly or openly hold a grudge. Maybe it's someone who you know, has done something to you recently. Maybe it's someone in your past, a long time ago, family member, whatever it might be, who really wronged you. So if you are a Christian, if you have accepted the forgiveness of God, then you need to forgive your Christian brother or sister too. And there are a few things I want to say about this. The first thing I'm, you know, I want you to understand is that I'm not saying forgiving someone is easy. Now, in one sense, forgiveness can mean pretending that the person has not sinned against you, just like the end result of the king's forgiveness of the first servant's debt was as if he owed no money at all. This passage isn't saying that we should just ignore the effects of sin and pretend that everything is okay when it isn't. Remember that whole first section about going to the person and sorting it out. You see, the king acknowledged the full extent of the debt. The servant acknowledged the full extent of the debt. There was no pretending here. And the things that people, even Christians, do to each other are real and they cause real hurt, real pain. They can cause wounds that take a long time to heal. 
Now, amongst all the people who are watching this right now and at various stages this week, there will be those for whom their relationships with other Christians have been scarred by sin. Maybe you've been insulted, maybe you've been deceived, maybe you've been physically or emotionally abused. I respect and acknowledge the reality and the power of the hurt that may have been done to you. Those are real scars and dealing with them may be a, a complicated and painful process, a long process. But it is a process that we all need to go through. Well, thanks, John. It's a challenge, isn't it? I'm usually pretty quick to, to realise when somebody's done something against me, when they've done something to hurt me. But it's never so quick for me to be able to forgive. It's much harder, isn't it? The only reason we're able to forgive, of course, is because of God's forgiveness of us. God has taken our many sins and removed them from us. He has forgiven them through what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And so before we spend time in prayer to God, will you join with me as we say this prayer of confession, taking advantage of the forgiveness that God offers to each one of us. So let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Strengthen us to serve you and live our lives to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> because of Christ's great love and sacrifice, we know that this prayer has been answered. We've confessed our sins and so our sins are forgiven. And so let us now approach the throne of grace with confidence knowing that we can come and bring our prayers and our requests to him. Gina Carl is now going to lead us in prayer. My name's Gina Carl and I go to Gerringong Anglican regularly and I miss seeing everybody. I can't wait till we can get back together. I'm going to pray, so let's pray. We praise you, Lord, for being the creator of the whole world. Thank you for sustaining the earth, for the rain we have had in the past few months that has broken the drought in some areas. Thank you for the many different species of birds we hear and see every day flying in their beautiful patterns in the sky. Thank you for the cows we hear in the fields of Rose Valley and the stars that you made that look so beautiful at night. Thank you, Lord for making us in your image and for intimately caring about the small details of our lives. Thank you for all people groups throughout the earth and that you know each culture and language and care about them all. Lord, we confess that we don't always consider you in our daily decisions. We forget about you and we hurt you you who love us. We are sorry for wandering away from you. Please forgive us and guide us in paths of righteousness. We pray that you will refresh us by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to serve you wholeheartedly. Dear Lord, thank you for sparing Australia terrible death tolls from COVID-19. We remember that many other nations are still experiencing many thousands of deaths each day. We think of them now. India, North and South America, the Middle East and Indonesia, Europe and Africa and parts of Asia. May your message of love and salvation be spoken to those who are dying, grieving and questioning life's very meaning. Please strengthen your church in these countries and give hope to your people and those they care for. Help us here in Australia to be generous to all people here in Australia and overseas 
who are now unable to find daily food, shelter and work. May your people be the first to give and serve and help during this crisis. Help us not to become complacent or indifferent and help us to search for those who are needy. Lord Jesus, we pray for our church family. Thank you for the life of our brother Trevor Cuthbertson and that he trusted in you. Thank you for taking him into your presence after many weeks of frailty. Comfort Val and give her your peace during her time of loss. Please be near Mark, Joe, Peter, Sam, David and all Trevor and Val's family. And thank you, Lord, that they can have a funeral now of 50 people. There are others in our church family who are unwell or struggling in other ways. So we take a few moments now to pray for those we know of. We also remember Simon and Jess, our link missionaries. Bless them, Lord, with special time with Jess's family in Dubbo. May they have encouraging Zoom meetings with the young people in Bari in Italy. May they be able to lead them in ministry, even though they're not there in person. Please strengthen your people in Italy as they recover from the devastation COVID-19 brought there. We pray for all those in our church and wider community who are lonely. Comfort them, Lord, with your word and with a kind visitor to cheer them up. We pray for your wisdom and encouragement to all leaders in our country and our church. May they seek to serve you and the community. Please help Steve, John and Kaz as decisions need to be made and some ministries begin again locally. Please keep all the leaders and children safe as they meet again in person at church. Protect our church leaders, their families and all of us from the attacks of the devil and discouragement and help us to encourage one another. Let us join together now in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks, Gina. And thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. We've almost come to the end of our service, but before we finish, there's one thing I know that you've all been missing. Without having our live services, uh, we've been actually missing one of the most exciting parts of the service, the time for notices. Now, for those of you who are having withdrawal symptoms, there are a few uh, notices uh, to bring to your attention to keep you going. The first one is about our annual general meeting. We haven't been able to have one so far this year, but we're planning to have one on Sunday the 28th of June at 12 p.m. We're gonna be doing it via Zoom. And so if you would like to be part of that meeting, you will need to register and you will need to have your own device to log in. There will be an email coming around to all members of our church to show how you can be part of that meeting. Also, can I remind you that, that we will need to receive nominations for church warden, parish council, parish nominator and synod representative this year. So those nominations will need to come in five days before the meeting, so by Tuesday the 23rd of June. The second announcement is a sad announcement. Many of you will be aware that one of our beloved uh, congregation members, Trevor Cuthbertson, died during the week. There will be a funeral service 
uh, held at uh, Jerengo Anglican on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID restrictions, we're not, it's not able to be an open service where everyone can come. However, we will be recording the service and posting it on our YouTube channel so you can take, take part in the service there. Also, I want to encourage you to continue meeting together. There's lots of different ways we can get together. Here's one. Hi everyone. Um, we, last Sunday morning we invited um, two couples around and we had a lovely time watching, watching Zoom during Gong Anglican uh, and joining in. We had communion, I cut up some bread and I got out the tiny little wine glasses and we had some red wine with it for our communion. And it was just really special to be able to share that together with our friends. And then we enjoyed brunch afterwards. So can I encourage you, invite a few friends around and uh, enjoy fellowship together. It's really good. Another way we can get together is in our growth groups. Here's a couple of pictures of some of the groups that are, that are meeting. Some that are meeting face to face and some that are still meeting via Zoom. If you'd like to be part of one of these groups, please just get in contact. Uh, with one of us. The final announcement is to let you know that our Christianity Explored course will be starting very soon. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the wonderful Jesus that we've been hearing about, then please contact us. You can contact us using the, uh, the link on the page where, you've, where you found this service, and we'd love to help you and get to know who this, who this Jesus is. We've been thinking today about forgiveness how important it is for us to forgive one another. But again, we've been reminded that our forgiveness flows out of God's forgiveness of us. And God's forgiveness always relies on one thing. It always relies on his mercy, on his grace. We don't deserve his forgiveness. It's something that he freely gives. Our final song today reminds us of that incredible grace of God. So will you join with me as we sing, This is Amazing Grace.
God's grace really is amazing. And now he calls on us to share that grace with each other. So will you join with me as we finish off our service by saying the grace, a prayer wishing this grace of God that it would spread amongst us. So together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us.